This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Wednesday, December 9th, 2015. I'm Caleb Brown. Matt Ridley's new book looks at how new ideas emerge, those ripe for development and those doomed to fail. The book is The Evolution of Everything. He spoke at the Cato Institute last month. The most extraordinary improvements in in human living standards in the last 50 years or so, uh, as I like to put it, we've trebled our income, uh, hit reduced child mortality by two thirds, increased lifespan by a third uh, in in my lifetime, and it wasn't all my doing. Um, uh, uh, and it's um, it takes a lot of explaining. We should get our minds around why that happened, why it happened in this generation, why why it's possible for it to happen to human beings at all and not to rabbits and rocks. Uh, and um, of course, the answer is innovation. Uh, but then the question becomes, where does innovation comes from? Uh, and that's sort of what this book takes further. It explores the idea. Uh, and what I've done is, is uh, drill down into the idea that innovation comes from combination and recombination of existing ideas. That's a very similar process to the combination and recombination of genes, uh, which produces the raw material for biological evolution. Uh, but in biological evolution, you then have a process of selection, uh, where now the environment selects some of the combinations over some of the other combinations. And is that happening in human society? Well, of course it is, because some of the combinations that uh, inventors come up with don't get accepted, and others do. So clearly you've got a process of selection going on. So the closer you look at the way uh, innovation works uh, to change society, uh, the, the more it looks like biological evolution. So I wanted to see how far I could take that idea, whether I could... Uh, uh, turn everything uh, onto a Procrustean bed of Darwinism. Uh, and that's what this book is trying to do. And it's kind of, I've been working up to this uh, all my life in a way. And um, uh, John Tierney, introducing me yesterday, said, um, well, now you've written a book called The Evolution of Everything. There's nothing left to write about. Uh, um, unless I can find a book to write about called The Evolution of a Few Things I Forgot to Mention, which is possible. Um, uh, I think the Darwin's idea of evolution through natural selection is one of the great ideas uh, that human beings have ever come up with. It's uh, it's a uh, it's it's a difficult idea to get out, get your head around, uh, and it's counterintuitive. Um, and that is to say, particularly when we look at the natural world, still to this day, we see design, we see purpose, we see function. You can't look at the structure of the human eye and not uh, conclude that it was designed for seeing. Its job is to do seeing. Uh, and yet Darwin comes along and says that may be true in the sense that its form is fitted to its function, but that doesn't mean that someone had a plan to make something for seeing. It, it, produ it, it got that way spontaneously and without ever having a goal in mind. Uh, and that's the sort of the, the, the difficult bit about um, uh, natural selection that people to this day find very difficult about, about biological evolution. So what I'm kind of arguing is that the same is likely to be true of society because we can see evolution happening in, in human society. And therefore, when we find really well-functioning human institutions or human technologies, we should consider the possibility that they have emerged without a plan uh, in a bottom-up way rather than through top-down command and control uh, without someone really uh, being in charge of them. And therefore that Darwin's version of evolution by natural selection in genetic systems is the special theory of evolution, rather like uh, special relativity was the special theory of, of relativity, uh, and that there's a general theory of evolution that we should we should look at. That evolution happens everywhere. That it is uh, that that what happens in human society is much more incremental, much more gradual than we tend to assume. It doesn't. Society doesn't change in great big jumps. It tends to, when you look at it closely, be a case of moving to the adjacent possible. You 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 take one step and then you move to the next step. It's much more gradual than we thought. It shows descent with modification, so you can trace the family tree of of an idea or, or technology um, from its, its ancestors, uh, just as you can with a, a, a biological creature. 
And there's something inexorable about it. It it sort of moves forward whether we like it to or not. And you can't speed it up and you can't slow it down. I mean, we've known about Moore's law for 40, 50 years now, and yet Moore's law is still working. It's still going at the same speed. The fact that we know about it doesn't enable us to cheat it and to, to jump ahead of Moore's law. Um, that's the sort of thing that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. And, of course, crucially, if you're going to have an evolutionary system, there must be an element of trial and error. Uh, in other words, uh, in biological evolution, there has to be mutation and selection uh, in which the bad, uh, bad combinations of genes get rejected and the good ones get accepted. Uh, and that must be the case in uh, societal change if you're going to have an evolutionary change. So the question is, do we see trial and error? Do we see um, uh, human beings, when they're trying to change a technology or, or an or a institution or a system, uh, trying different ideas, some of which succeed and some of which don't? Uh, and I would argue that, yes, we do. Um, uh, the, the closer you look at how things change in human society, the more trial and error you find. Just a little example, the designs of aeroplanes in the first uh, few decades of aeroplanes, there's an ex a ferment of experimentation in, in, in how you design the tailplane or the wings, how many wings you have, whether you have the propeller at the front or the back. You know, there's all sorts of different designs which, which are tried, some of which survive and some of which don't. And, of course, the corollary of this is that we're not recognizing this enough. We're not recognizing that evolution is uh, the, 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 the way which society changes uh, we are creationists, and um, there are, uh, you know, I, Don Boudreau, for example, makes this point very clearly in, in terms of economics that uh, we we tend to believe that someone has designed uh, an outcome when actually it's emerged um, uh, within society. Now, I might be being a little bit Procrustean here. Uh, Procrustes, as you remember, stretched his guests so they fitted the bed um, that he made them stay on. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's certainly true that I'm going to have to concede at certain points that there are top-down things in the world. There are um, individuals who matter, who make a difference in history. Um, it's not always ordinary people interacting among each other who bubble up ideas. Um, but I think that we have erred on the side of thinking that things are more top-down than they are. So just to give you some sort of thoughts to get you... Some, some, I mean, the book is full of anecdotes of, of, of things that have changed in an evolutionary way in human society. Um, uh, just to give you some examples. Music. Take, the, take music. Music is always changing. You know, the, every generation has different genres of music in different parts of the world, in different places, but there's a con continual evolution of music. And it's pretty gradual when you, when you think about it. Of course, there are sort of people who get called revolutionaries in music, but when you look at it, they're kind of building on what came before. You know, the Beatles is building on it, Elvis Presley is building on... Uh, blues and rock or whatever. Uh, and you can also see the cross-fertilization that is characteristic of an e evolutionary system where two types of music come together and, and um, uh, swap ideas and come up with, with a third. Uh, but you can see dissent with modification in music very clearly. Gods. Gods are another thing that evolve. Uh, in the um, uh, Bronze Age, gods were vengeful and petty tyrants who got very upset if you offended them and things like that. And uh, you know, they had really rather mundane uh, concerns in their lives. Um, now they're disembodied spirits of benevolence, um, and there tends to be only one of them. Uh, that's a change that you can see gradually coming through history at different times and in different places. Uh, and I have a, a chapter on the evolution of religion, which is guaranteed to offend um, quite a lot of people. <laughs> Um, but then there's something to offend everyone in pretty well every chapter in, in the book. Government, for example. Um, I, I like to say about this book that um, uh, my right-wing friends won't like what I say about God and my left-wing friends won't like what I say about government. So uh, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um, <laughs> governments, essentially you can trace the history of governments pretty clearly as a gradual evolutionary thing. They evolve out of protection rackets. Government starts as somebody asserting a monopoly of violence on society, uh, essentially saying, look, instead of us all fighting each other, I'm going to be the one with the weapons, 
and the rest of you are not. Uh, and that's all right because there'll be peace because I will have all the weapons. And that's essentially where governments come from. And you can see, I mean, I, give, I tell the story in, in the book, a wonderful um, bit of work by David Scarbeck on the emergence of uh, spontaneous governance in prison gangs. That prison gangs essentially are about uh, imposing monopoly of violence uh, within a prison and thereby suppressing violence. And it's the same phenomenon. It's, it's a form of government evolving. Um, so it's happening even today. But of course, governments move on and become very different things, and they start uh, do, pr providing other services than just monopoly of violence. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, eventually, they come up with welfare states and so on. So, so it, 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 the, the history of government is a very evolutionary history. Cities, cities evolve very clearly. Uh, they, the, there are rules about what a city looks like at a certain stage, at a certain size and a certain stage of development. Uh, these rules are not written down. They're not laws. They're not, you, know, you don't have to obey them, but it turns out that cities do obey them. There are wonderful regularities about this. Jeffrey West has particularly written well about this. And, of course, what these things are, I would argue, are phenomena that are the product of human action but not the product of human design. And that, of course, is a famous quote from the 18th century Scottish philosopher Adam Ferguson, um, who, who said there's a whole category of things out there that are not man-made, man-designed objects, like, you know, this uh, wooden thing, um, uh, and they're not natural objects either. Uh, they are somewhere in between. They're man-made in the sense that, uh, you know, clearly human beings were involved in their creation, uh, and yet there's no sense in which they were designed, uh, they were planned. The clearest example of that, I think, is the English language. When you think about it, the English language is clearly man-made, it's not a natural phenomenon, uh, and yet it is, uh, and it's full of rules, it's full of structure, it's full of order, uh, it's extremely complex, it's, it's got a beautiful fit between form and function, it's as complex as a rainforest in terms of each word having its place in the, in the vocabulary, just like each species has its place in a rainforest. Uh, and yet it's ridiculous to say that it was designed by anyone or that it's run by anyone. Uh, uh, there is no chief executive of the English language, thank goodness. Uh, there is no central committee. Um, uh, uh, there is no constitution of the English language. And it's full of rules that we all obey, but we don't even know half the time. We know some of the rules of the English language, but a lot of them uh, have emerged spontaneously. So, for example, there's a rule that uh, in English you shorten words if you're going to use them frequently. So most of the frequently used words in English language are short. Um, and also there's another rule that uh, short frequently used words don't change their meanings, whereas long infrequently words can change their meanings. These are the kinds of rules you pick up if you study English closely, uh, but we're all kind of a, we're all not really aware of them, and yet we're obeying them. Uh, and there's no Supreme Court to tell us that we have to obey these rules, and yet we do. In the book, I go back 2,000 years to try and find the origin of the first person who really sees this clearly, and I, I fasten on Lucretius, uh, the Roman poet, who was uh, hymning the virtues of Epicurus and the Epicurean philosophy uh, and who died in the middle of writing his only poem, uh, as far as we can tell, because it ends rather abruptly. Um, uh, uh, the poem is called De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating poem. It had an enormous influence on, on later history, particularly on Thomas Jefferson, had five different copies of it in his library, uh, Spinoza, um, Voltaire, all these kind of people were hugely influenced by, by Lucretius de Rerum Natura. The poem disappeared for uh, about 12 centuries uh, because the Christian church didn't like it, because it's a very uh, atheistic poem. It says there's no such thing as gods or spirits, uh, and it's unbelievably modern in some ways, because what he says is that the world consists of atoms and voids. Nothing else, there's just atoms and voids no spirits, there's no essences, there's no, uh, and, and, and a living creature is made of atoms and voids just as a non-living creature is atoms and voids. It's just they're different combinations of atoms and voids. Now we know that's true. How he knew that 2,000 years ago, it, it, it almost boggles the mind to, to understand. 
but of course, it's a very evolutionary view because it's about recombining. It's about recombining things. And in, in places, he gets terribly close to sounding like... He sounds, he sounds like Charles Darwin in places. He also sounds like Richard Dawkins in places. Um, so, um, so I use little quotes from Lucretius to, to make the point that this isn't a new idea throughout the book. Uh, but jump forward to 1759, the year in which Adam Smith publishes uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, which is a century, exactly a century before Charles Darwin publishes The Origin of Species. Uh, and you find the same sort of idea in that book. Theory of Moral Sentiments is a very radical book, a very subversive book, uh, but a very difficult to understand book. It's rather densely written. But what he's saying in that book is that morality emerges from the way we interact with each other as ordinary people. It doesn't emerge from priests telling us what to do. We don't need to be told what's right and wrong. We work it out for ourselves. We calibrate our behavior according to how people react to us. Uh, if we go around killing people and people lock us up for doing it, we learn that that's a bad thing to do. Uh, uh, and so essentially you can have different versions of morality in different society according to how people are are, are, are getting feedback for their behaviour. That essentially we decide among ourselves what's right and what's wrong. And of course this is a terribly subversive thing to say in the 18th century because uh, you're supposed to think that if it wasn't for priests telling you who what was right and wrong, nobody would know what was right and wrong. Um, Smith then goes on to uh, write The Wealth of Nations and make very much the same sort of point about the economy, that it's an emergent phenomenon, that it's a... Uh, it's driven by an invisible hand, a phrase he uses in both moral, moral sentiments and wealth of nations. Um, and that, you know, it, it is not possible to plan uh, the economy of a country or a city. Uh, it emerges through, tra through um, uh, supply and demand and, tra and uh, uh, trial and error and um, the price mechanism. And, and he has, I think, this rather wonderful sentence in uh, Wealth of Nations where he says, the sovereign is completely discharged from a duty in the attempting to perform which he must always be exposed to innumerable delusions and for the proper performance of which no human wisdom or knowledge could ever be sufficient. The duty of superintending the industry of private people and of directing it towards the employment most suitable to the interests of society. So he's saying you simply couldn't plan uh, uh, an economy uh, the way we do manage to do it. By the way, I just want to say something parenthetically at this point, which is to say that to say society evolves and technology evolves and culture evolves is not social Darwinism. It's the very opposite. It's 180 degrees, degrees different. Um, social Darwinism was essentially the 19th century idea that now we've discovered that biological evolution happens, we need for society to progress to help that biological evolution happen by uh, telling people who, who they can marry or who they can't marry, by uh, um, um, telling people whether they should be uh, sterilized or not and eventually telling people whether they should be killed or not. Uh, and so essentially it's about helping social progress through assisting biological evolution. Uh, and I'm saying quite the opposite, that actually what we should do is encourage ideas to die so that people don't have to die. Uh, essentially. It's about cultural change. And there is a perfectly good theory of this now. Uh, I mean, you know, I, uh, in this book, I rely hugely on a lot much cleverer people than me to, to, to underpin the ideas I'm writing about. And Rob Boyd, Pete Richardson, and, and Joe Henrik have, in my view, uh, created a, a really coherent theory of cultural evolution, uh, which is essentially about under what conditions will you get an evolutionary phenomenon emerging between people and among people? Uh, and they essentially say that any system of information, where you're sharing information, where you're exchanging information, uh, if there's a degree of fidelity, a degree of uh, mutation in, in, in the system, uh, uh, and, degree, uh, and, and a degree of selective survival, you will get uh, natural, spontaneous, undirected evolution. Uh, that you don't have to have particulate information, which is what people used to think uh, about cultural evolution. The, the problem was you don't have a, something equivalent to a gene, which is a sort of specific um, hard object, uh, if you like. 
Um, now, one of the reasons we, um, we are too creationist about the human world, I think, uh, is because we have something called the intentional stance, what, uh, what uh, Dan Dennett calls the intentional stance. Dan Dennett has this under, other wonderful analogy, which is the, the, the phrase skyhook. Um, he says that uh, we tend to go around thinking that the world is built using skyhooks, that we build buildings by attaching a hook to the sky and then build them from the top down, um, which would be incredibly, inconven- incredibly convenient if we could do it. Uh, but, uh, of course, we can't. And the phrase originated in a, um, uh, an episode in the First World War where a pilot was told to stay up there because we were not ready for you yet. You just stay up there. And he replied, this machine is not fitted with skyhooks. Um, uh, and it, so Dan Dennett uses the skyhook for the, 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 the flaw in our thinking where we tend to see top down when we should see bottom up. Um, and... Of course, we, we, we clearly have a sort of quite sensible tendency to do this because we, we look at the world and we think, well, hang on, um, some, uh, you know, that looks purposeful or it's, it's probably better to err on the side of assuming it is. So when a thunderstorm um, knocks down your neighbour's house, you think, well, he must be a sinful chap. So, you know, that was, that was the, the right thing to do. And throughout history, we've, we've kind of tended to... To, to, to see intention where there isn't intention. We're, we're, we've got a hair trigger for seeing intentionality. Um, one consequence of this way of looking at society is that uh, it's very sceptical of the great man theory um, of history. The great man theory of history is that, that history is, is caused by great men rather than great men are caused by history. Um, and... Uh, the French Enlightenment was particularly resistant to this idea uh, and said we've spent far too much time thinking that Julius Caesar or someone w- was important. Actually, we should look at um, uh, the, 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 the all, what, what ordinary people are doing uh, and the, the fact that great men are taking the credit, uh, as it were. Uh, and so if you look up in the Encyclopédie, the uh, great manifesto of the French Enlightenment written by Diderot and d'Alembert, um, you find there are no biographical entries at all. They went that far. They said, let's, let's just not put any... So if you want to read Isaac Newton's biography in that book, you have to look up the entry under Woolstrop, which is the village he was born in, in, in Lincolnshire. Um, and yet it's clear that, you know, after the 20th century, it's pretty hard to believe that human beings, individual human beings, can't change history. Clearly there can be huge top-down influences on history from individuals. We have Mao, we have Stalin, we have Hitler and others to to show us that. And to some extent we have Churchill on the other side, probably the only politician in Britain who who wouldn't have done a deal with Hitler had anyone else got into power. It It might have come out differently. But I think it's true, as Lord Acton said, that great men are usually bad men. Um, uh, that uh, it's much easier to take history by the scruff of the neck and change it in a different direction, in a bad direction, than in a good direction. And if, there's, if, if I'm sceptical of the great man theory of history in, in history, although I admit they, they do exist, even more so when it comes to technology. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in the 1870s. So did 22 other people in the same decade independently. Um, In Britain, we give the credit to Joseph Swan. He came from the town I come from, Newcastle, so we're very firm in Newcastle that Edison is a fraud and Joseph Swan deserves all the credit. They actually ended up sort of going into business together, uh, uh, but um, Edison was the better businessman. In Russia, they say it was Lodigin who invented the light bulb, and it's nonsense, all this Edison nonsense, you know, etc. And, of course, everybody's right. Actually, the point was the light bulb was a ripe idea by the 1870s. It was the next adjacent possible step to take. The technology was all in place to recombine it and produce the idea of a light bulb. And it's inconceivable that if uh, Edison hadn't existed... Uh, we wouldn't have light bulbs. You know, it was the, 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 you know, the vacuum, the glowing filament, the, the glass uh, case. These are all things that had to come together around then. Uh, and that's true of almost every invention you can think of. Think of the search engine, one of the great innovations of my lifetime. I use it every day. Uh, uh, and as important to my generation as the steam engine was to the um, uh, 18th century. Uh, 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 and yet... If 
Larry Page had never met Sergey Brin, do we think we'd not have search engines now? No, of course we would. In fact, there were about 20 search engines on the market when Google was founded in 1994. It's just that Google came up with the best one and managed to sweep, sweep the pool. Um, and this is true, of course, of scientific discovery too. Uh, Charles Darwin hit on the idea of evolution and then so did Ru Alfred Russell Wallace a few years later. And it was because Wallace was about to scoop him that Darwin rushed into print. Um, even Einstein, who tends to stand out as being a unique genius who saw things that nobody else did, uh, was actually someone who, uh, had, he not ex had, had Einstein fallen under a tram uh, in Switzerland um, before he got to special relativity, Hendrik Lorentz would have come up with special relativity. As Kevin... Kelly uh, documents in his book, What Technology Wants, we know of six different inventors of the thermometer, three of the hypodermic needle, four of vaccination, four of decimal fractions, five of the electric telegraph, four of photography, three of logarithms, five of the steamboat, six of the electric uh, railroad. Now, I'm not saying scientists and inventors don't matter. Clearly, they do. You, clearly, you have to have you know, the right conditions for people to come up with this kind of thing and the right conditions for Edison to turn a, make a business out of them and so on. But I am saying that that there's, there's an inexorable, inevitable evolutionary nature to this. And the more you look at innovation, the more what really counts is, is ordinary people uh, interacting, not one or two brilliant geniuses. Uh, um, uh, because of Nobel Prizes, because of patents, we tend to give one or two geniuses the credit, but actually a lot of it is, is bottom-up. Uh, and this, of course, challenges the linear model that that science comes before technology, which comes before application. I don't think that's, that's true. Um, and the best example of this that we've got in front of us today is the Internet. Uh, the Internet is uh, clearly something that is the, the result of human action but not of human design, um, in the sense that nobody had a plan for it, nobody is in charge of it to this day, there is no central committee, thank goodness, although people keep trying to be in charge of it. Um, uh, and it doesn't originate in a couple of brilliant individuals. Sure, you can give Tim Berners-Lee or, or um, Bint Cerf or someone you know, credit for certain parts of it, but they're pretty dispensable in the sense that if they hadn't been there, someone else would have come up with these, these technologies. And in fact, what, the, the closer you look, uh, and you certainly can't give Al Gore credit, by the way, um, uh, <laughs> And, and, and yes, it came out of government to some extent, but it also came out of industry, and actually it didn't. It came out of ordinary people on networks, and it's pretty inconceivable that in the, uh, the, at the time when it appeared, the, the networking of computers because of communication technology would not have happened somehow. Um, uh, so it very much is a bottom-up thing. It was most of the protocols we use on the Internet were developed by peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, in a in a, in in a, in a by people we've don't, we've never heard of, uh, as Stephen Berlin Johnson puts it, you can't even call the internet bottom up because it has no top, so it's a meaningless uh, phrase. And what's what's has the internet is the, is that is that the end of things? No, of course not. It's just the beginning of what we're going to be able to do uh, with evolutionary systems online. I can't predict the future, no one else can, but I suspect that if you want to understand what comes next uh, on the internet, blockchain may well be the way to look. Uh, blockchain looks like uh, it's the technology behind Bitcoin, it's the technology that disintermediates uh, government and finance and law and things like this, potentially, not yet. Uh, it, 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 because it's a machine for creating trust, for, for self-verifying uh, that you are who you say you are and that you can do what you say you can do, uh, that it will create a whole new ecosystem of uh, doing business that, that could be very exciting and could w result in some, some very odd worlds in which you don't need bankers and you don't need lawyers. What a pity. Um, <laughs> I want to just end with um, uh, one clear story of an evolutionary system versus a command and control system, and it's topical, and that's the China's one-child policy, which came to an end a couple of weeks ago. Um, the demographic transition is the reduction in the birth rate that happens all around the world uh, when people 
get a little bit more prosperous and a bit better educated uh, and, and somewhat healthier. Essentially, you know, once child mortality drops, people plan smaller families and they invest in quality rather than quantity of kids. Uh, and we now know, because it's happened on pretty well every continent, it's happening on, in Africa at the moment, that if you can get health and, uh, and, and wealth and education to people, the birth rate will drop as a sort of evolutionary consequence of that, as an unplanned consequence of that. And that, I would say, is the sort of evolutionary version of, of the demographic transition. But China decided that it wanted to do a top-down one instead. And the one-child policy was both futile and inhumane. It was futile because it genuinely didn't work. The Chinese birth rate fell more in the 10 years before the policy came in than in the 10 years after, which is truly remarkable when you think about it. Um, but it was a very specifically top-down piece of social engineering, which originated actually in the West. A man named Song Jian, who was a control systems expert in a missile technology laboratory in China. Um, that is to say, his job was to work out where the missile would land after you fire it. Um, he went to a conference in Helsinki in 1978. Uh, this is all, by the way, in Susan Greenhull's uh, book, Just One Child. Uh, and there he came across a book called The Limits to Growth, which was a manifesto of the um, Club of Rome, uh, which was full of people saying, um, we environmentalists are very worried about the population explosion. We need to plan the world in future. We cannot go on with this unplanned world where population growth is going to go on uh, uncontrolled. We need to work out how to tell people how many babies they can have uh, and, if necessary, enforce this f firmly. And he loved this idea, Song Jian did, and he went back to China. He republished a lot of it under his own name. Uh, he became more famous for his population ideas than for his uh, missile control ideas. And he eventually got the idea, he got the ear of a uh, deputy prime minister, and even Deng Xiaoping was then persuaded. And the, the one child policy was brought in within a year and a half of him getting back from Helsinki. Uh, and he, it was specifically his, his plan. And they put a horrible general in charge, and it was very inhumanely expressed. So that's why I think ev an evolutionary view of the world is a much more humane view of the world than a top-down view of the world. And we should, we should learn to be more suspicious uh, of top-down plans, but also of top-down interpretations of how the world works. Um, just to finish, Marion mentioned that I'm now in the House of Lords in, in, in Britain, which you might think is rather... You know, what's this chap coming along from an elite institution telling us that uh, elites don't matter? Um, and it, you've got a good point there. Um, uh, but we're very up to date in the House of Lords, and I'll give you a, 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 an example of how that is and why that is. One of my colleagues the other day said, I'm too old to understand social media. Um, I can't cope online, so... Uh, you know, it's, it's going to have to bypass me. But I do understand that the world changes and we have to keep up with the world and we have to understand how the world, world moves forward. And so I'm going to do in everyday life what people do on social media. I'm going to walk down the street, go up to people and tell them I like them um, <laughs> and show them pictures of my wife and my cat, um, tell them what I had for breakfast. Um, and he said, it's working. I've got followers, two social, <laughs> two social workers and a policeman. Thank you very much. Matt Ridley is author of The Evolution of Everything. You can watch the full book forum at cato.org.